Ignition sequence starts. Good morning. You've got a good view here inside the International Space Station Flight Control Room, where the Orbit 2 team of flight controllers has the shift now, keeping watch over space station systems while assisting the Expedition 64 crew members with their science research and station maintenance. After wrapping up the sixth spacewalk of the increment last week, Commander Sergei Rizikov and his American, Russian, and Japanese crewmates had a full agenda of science support this week, while some of them got ready for a short trip around the block. Houston Station on Space to Ground. Welcome to Space to Ground. I'm Kayla France. After a weekend of spacewalking around, the crew on board the International Space Station was back in action, performing science and station maintenance. The spacewalk on March 13th marked the fifth EVA of the year and the 237th spacewalk in support of the space station. NASA astronauts Victor Glover and Michael Hopkins took a stroll outside the orbiting laboratory to service the station's cooling system and communications gear. Concluding their spacewalk after 6 hours and 47 minutes, the duo managed to complete their tasks that included venting the early ammonia system to relocate a jumper line, servicing the Columbus Bartolomeo payload platform, and configuring a cable for an amateur radio system. Back inside, JAXA astronaut Suichi Noguchi was completing the Asian Urban Space Investigation. With the aim of improving efforts to cultivate fast-growing plants in space and enhancing the understanding of how plants grow efficiently and develop aroma-rich leaves through hydroponic culture, Asian Urban Space is a project of the Space Seeds for Asian Future program, a program which allows researchers and students in the Asia-Pacific region to grow plants in space aboard the International Space Station and then compare the plants with those grown on Earth. And obviously, in order for plants to grow, we need three things. First, some nutrition. Second, water and, and the lights. And the nutrition and the water is already there inside. And we need the lights. And we use this space station uh, general lighting assembly, uh, which is just a regular light. And uh, in order to make sure we have enough light into the, the chamber, which means the plant, we have a uh, photosensing film attached on top of it to make sure we have enough lighting into the chamber. The space-flown seeds will soon be distributed to schools to learn about the importance of space biology research. Do you have a favorite photo of Earth taken by an astronaut aboard the space station? Then we need your votes for Tournament Earth 2021. For more than 20 years, Astronauts have been shooting photographs of Earth from the International Space Station. Their unique view of our planet and all its wonder has inspired us. So which are the best photographs of Earth taken from the space station? Over the next few weeks, you can decide. Follow the link below to see the photos competing in each bracket, to download a tournament bracket, and to learn more. Images competing for the title spot have been chosen by astronauts the Earth Science and Remote Sensing Team, and space enthusiasts like you. Voting in round two will end on March 22nd at noon Eastern, so get your votes in. That's Space to Ground for this week. Thanks for watching. We'll see you next week. If you watched NASA TV coverage of last week's spacewalk, you had a chance to see some terrific views of planet Earth, captured from 250 miles above as the International Space Station cruised along in orbit at a speed of some five miles a second. Along with the cameras on the outside of the vehicle and the ones in the hands of the spacewalkers, the station has some great picture windows that the human crew members can use. And in the Destiny Laboratory, they have a special piece of hardware that combines art and science. An intersection of art and science on the station. Presented by Science at NASA.
Large and powerful telescopes have delivered stunning images of our galaxy and the universe. A little closer to home, my colleagues have taken some equally stunning photographs of our own planet from the International Space Station. My name is Mario Runco, and I'm an Earth scientist and former space shuttle astronaut. After seeing our beautiful home planet from orbit, I wanted to be able to share the experience with everyone. So one of the NASA accomplishments of which I am most proud was helping to spearhead the creation of the WARF, the Window Observational Research Facility on the ISS. My colleagues, Dr. Dean Epler and Dr. Karen Scott and I, envisioned a small facility, about the size of a large refrigerator, that would enhance the capabilities of the large, Earth-viewing, optical-quality window that we were previously successful in getting aboard the station. This vision became reality as the wharf was launched to the station in 2010 on board the STS-131 mission of the Space Shuttle Discovery. The optical quality window and the wharf are a perfect blend of art and science. They allow us to conduct Earth science research and capture amazing high-resolution photographs of the Earth. The window is located in the U.S. Destiny Laboratory module and features the highest quality optics ever flown on a crewed spacecraft. It is 20 inches or 51 centimeters in diameter and includes a non-optical quality retractable pane that protects it when it is not in use, but still allows natural light into the station and provides a great view for the crew. The wharf is capable of housing a variety of sensors within the shirt sleeve environment inside the space station and serve as a test bed for the development of new sensor technology. These sensors can be used to study atmospheric, oceanic, and surface terrain conditions as well as make environmental health assessments. Observations made from the wharf can provide important data on transient atmospheric and geologic phenomena, such as tropical cyclones and volcanic eruptions. It also helps us to better understand our local solar system environment. The National Laboratory Meteor Investigation allows for spectroscopic analysis of meteors as they enter the Earth's upper atmosphere. The wharf's presence on the space station allows its sensors to image the same location or region multiple times over several days. This allows for observations that can show, for example, how vegetation below may be changing from day to day. Subtle changes detectable by orbital sensors that might be indicative of declining plant health are rarely visible on the ground in their early stages, and often by the time they are, it is too late and crops or even forests may be lost. My colleagues and I are all avid Star Trek fans, and we decided to name the facility Wharf after the Honorable Klingon Warrior. We designed a mission patch that included Klingon script for the acronym Wharf, and even an alternate version with a depiction of an astronaut bearing an uncanny resemblance to science officer Spock making observations of the Earth from the Wharf. For more of the many wonders that can be observed from Earth orbit, go to nasa.gov forward slash ISS-science. For similar out-of-this-world stories, visit science.nasa.gov. Spacewalks can provide some nice variety, but Expedition 64 crew members maintain a focus on their support of one-of-a-kind scientific research on this orbiting laboratory. It was more than four years ago that flight engineer Kate Rubens became the first person to ever sequence DNA in space. So recently, when she moved space science further ahead with another crucial milestone for microbiology, the research team here in Houston took a moment to recognize Rubens' spot in scientific history. While you do that, I have a few words for you. So today marks four years, four months, three weeks, and five days since one monumental jump of paradigm-shifting space science occurred when you, for the first time, sequenced DNA beyond the bounds of Earth. Since that time, six of your crew members have advanced that work and demonstrated significant advancements in microbiology through culture-dependent and culture-independent identification of microbes, human diagnostics when native RNA was prepped and directly sequenced on station, and in fundamental biology when sequencing was used to assess DNA repair following cellular transformation and CRISPR-based DNA damage all on board. And that came from the minds of a team of high school students who won genes in space. Your work revolutionized space science and today marks another significant achievement with the collection, preparation, and sequencing of highly complex and multiplex samples. 
On behalf of the Biomolecule Sequencer team, uh, aka Manion team, myself, uh, Sarah Stahl-Rommel, Aaron Burton, and Christian John, and the whole space flight science community, we thank you for continuing to push space science through your work on board and through all you do to socialize and emphasize the importance of molecular biology in space. Thank you, Kate. Oh my gosh, you guys are going to make me cry. This is so cool. Um, I'm just incredibly excited to see this, and I've been talking about multiplexing for years, so this is amazing uh, that you guys have been able to do this, and, and it's it's really, really, really fun to uh, be at the pointy end of this spear here and, and to uh, get a chance to do the sequencing in space. So I'm very excited about this, and I can't wait until we're sequencing, multiplexing 96 well plates and swabbing everything on the space station. <laughs> That's where we're headed next. Along with doing hands-on science in the International Space Station's laboratories, the crew members spend some of their time talking directly with students on the ground to share the experience. And they get to make some fun instructional videos in zero-g. In this installment of the STEM Instruction Series, astronaut Scott Tingle describes the orbit of spacecraft and offers the viewers a chance to participate. Hello, my name is Scott Tingle, and I'm living and working on board the International Space Station. You know, I love my views from the cupola. It's our orbiting altitude of around 400 kilometers or 250 miles above the Earth's surface that gives us these unique perspectives. Let's explore how our ISS orbits work. Come on. First, I should explain, orbits are elliptical or oval in shape, with some being almost circular. Planets, comets, and moons have elliptical orbits. Spacecraft orbiting Earth, like the space station, are placed into a nearly circular orbit to keep a consistent altitude as they travel around the planet. Let's take a look at the Earth. It has a radius of 6,378 kilometers. And the station orbits about 400 kilometers above the surface at eight kilometers per second. That's 17,500 miles per hour. See if you can use these values to calculate how far, how long we travel in one orbit around the Earth. All of this information and more activities related to orbits are available in the accompanying lesson plan at nasa.gov slash stem on station. Amber, coming in. Four, Four three, two, one. The answers to the questions, by the way, are approximately 42,600 kilometers and 90 minutes. And due to our altitude on orbit, we have our very unique and awesome view of the Earth. Thanks for exploring with me today. I'm gonna to send you back to Earth now so you can start your challenge on orbits. See you again soon. At NASA, we're working to return astronauts to the moon in just a few years. To explore it and to learn to live there long term, it's part of the plan to get humans ready to explore out into the solar system in the years to come. It's called the Artemis Program. And last summer, teams here in Houston went into the giant swimming pool called the Neutral Buoyancy Laboratory to work on developing tools and training plans for the astronauts who will conduct the moonwalks of the future. Take a look.
International Space Station crew members each spend years in training to prepare for their mission. It's the sort of training that awaits those of their colleagues who will take part in the Artemis program missions, too. Actors Kelly Marie Tran and Naomi Aki from the film Star Wars The Rise of Skywalker spent a day at NASA's Johnson Space Center recently and worked with astronauts Megan MacArthur and Jessica Watkins on a few of the pieces of cool training equipment that get our astronauts ready for their missions off the Earth. Hey, how are you doing? <laughs> my name's Naomi Aki. And my name's Kelly Marie Tran. And we're at NASA's Johnson Space Center. Mm -hmm. And we're training to be astronauts. No big deal. Come on, let us do it! Let's go! Um, what's called a gravity offload system. So people often think that we have a room here where you can go in and flip a switch and suddenly you're floating. That's, that's not really how it works. You want to see how it works when you're one sixth your weight or three eighths your weight. Uh, we use Argos to do that. And then we use it to work on like new tools, new geology, sampling procedures. Uh... So from here, what we do is we'll lift you up off the ground. Oh my God. And we'll put you into lunar gravity. <laughs> Alright, so this right here is zero gravity. So if you're Whoa. on a space station and I were to push you and say, see ya, you're yeah. just gonna Whoa. take away the way I push you. So what did you guys do to that? It was, <laughs> it was so cool. I was saying I realize now why astronauts walk like this. Yeah! Because <laughs> everyone's just like trying as much as yeah. possible. Well, do you guys wanna go check out suits? Yeah! Wanna go try some more? We're going to talk to you a little bit about spaces today. Yeah. Um, we're going to move some suits over here, I think, real quick, and uh, um, we'll talk to you a little bit about what they are, and then we're going to let you guys change and actually try, try this out. So you go out there, and there's no air. Mm -hmm. So then there's pressure pushing in on your body. So what we would have to go through is your body would want to expand out, so that's why we wear a suit around us that goes through and creates an artificial atmosphere. Do you, do you guys have training in terms of how quickly you can get in and out of these? Is that um, a thing or not? No, like, I mean, you have to know your yeah. spacesuit really well, but we don't do drills like getting yeah. in them quickly. You typically are helping each other getting into and out of them when you're when you're in space. And so those tubes actually are going to carry a whole oh, yeah, well, Help us blow and see what that feels like once you get inside. But these guys are going to help you get behind the Yeah, like that would be the guy who came to Chewbacca. Really? Oh, that's weird. <laughs> Stand up. Well, unfortunately, we're going to get you guys out of the suit now, but then we're going to take you over and Just see like, no. the vehicle that you would be in the suits in. Okay. In the Orion vehicle. This is the Space Launch System. This is what's going to push this capsule. This is the Artemis 1. This is going to go to the moon about one year from now. Yes. <laughs> yes. Oh my gosh. Yes. <laughs> Okay. Nine and nine it. <laughs> yeah. This is the docking hatch up here. When we when we get to the gateway, yeah. we will dock at that port, mm -hmm. and there will be a hatch up there that we open to go into Which the gateway. Which you have to like yeah. target, right? So you have to like figure out a way to drive the rocket so that the holes match up. Bingo. You know right? how precise it is. First of all, relative to the Earth, we're going over twenty thousand miles an hour, and when we dock meet up with this plus or minus one inch, plus or minus one degree in each Ooh. axis. Okay, that's <laughs> <okay>. really <laughs> difficult. Yeah, we actually oh, make the yeah. switches, it's a multi-step so you don't accidentally hit a switch. Uh, we're gonna go check out the mock-ups for the space station, which Ooh. will seem luxuriously large. <laughs> okay, sorry. This gives you an idea of uh, how big of a room each person gets, so you can put up, yeah, your personal space. space. Oh, so yeah, you do, um, you, you you have a sleeping bag, as they mentioned, and you can pin that to the wall, mm -hmm. and um, you can float kind of inside your sleeping bag. You can so tighten cool. it down if you would like to feel a little bit more stable. This is Houston. Yes. Um, this is when they actually say Houston, we have a problem. This is Houston. So that's live. <laughs> <laughs> They're in space right now. What are they doing? I just, oh my gosh, it's mad. What's the day to day like in this room? Yeah. So, in this room, we have three shifts a day. 
My favorite shift is the night shift because it's when nobody's in this building, but we get to hang out with the crew. Are you guys ready to try some space food? Yeah. That's next on the list. Where do you get the suggestions of what to work on next? Ooh, that's a great question. We get a lot from the crew office. Or the crew office says, can we move away from red meat and potatoes and get Brussels sprouts, butternut squash, and this comes from a lot of crew comments as well as input from the nutrition line here at JSC that says, you guys should probably go with the salt in there. So on station, the astronauts have a much more advanced dehydration <laughs> apparatus. Okay. They have the potable water dispenser. The astronauts can help you with figuring out how to unlock the straw. Just release this. Great. Oh, so otherwise, so that way when you set it down, it it's not going to come up on the top. Is it so stuff is at the bottom, so you want to like... Oh, she knows the tray. She knows the tricks of the tray here. Yeah. Yeah. Which one is your favorite? Mm, I would say the butternut squash is yeah. my favorite. But I like things that are sweet. Mm -hmm. I like the Brussels sprouts, I think. Mm -hmm. They're so good. All right, well, you guys have had your afternoon snack. Mm -hmm. Now you're ready yes. to go drive a lunar rover. Mm -hmm. All right, let's go check I it out. I really don't know how to drive. Is this like going to be a <laughs> teacher? Oh, no. Oh, 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 you're in the rover, like Megan and Jessica will be in the rover for up to 14 days living wow. together. Um, and there'll be another rover, they'll go out for 14 days and explore. And if one breaks down, all four of you will we'll get jump in one vehicle. I think I made contact. I think we're there. Uh, awesome. <laughs> yeah, we're there. Yeah. That was nice to what an amazing day. No, it's been really good. It's, so it's been amazingly, it's more more than I expected. Yeah. I just have so much respect for NASA. Um, yeah. Thank you for Thank bringing you, us NASA. here. The International Space Station provides a spot to keep an eye on the changes occurring here on the planet. But it turns out it does more than that. Cosmonaut Sergei Krikalev, a member of Expedition 1 more than 20 years ago and later commander of Expedition 11, says the more than 800 days spent in space over his career helped him develop his perspective on the power of human beings from all over the planet working together in space. I read a lot of uh, science fiction, I think good science fiction, and because of that I thought, well, it, that's uh, probably an interesting thing to spend my life on. First, on orbit, you start to feel weightlessness. And I remember first time looking outside, I was amazed to see curved horizon because before that, although we theoretically knew that we are on the globe, but from orbit, you already see curvature of the Earth, and that was first surprise. Again, I, I knew it, but to see with your own eyes that you have pretty thin layer of atmosphere that protecting us, that's another interesting experience. When you look down, uh, you have uh, some kind of blue filter. And this blue filter make all colors actually not so distinct. So really, green is not so green, it's more like bluish green. Blue is more blue because again, we have more uh, blue from atmosphere. And uh, where we have really bright colors is on horizon, especially during sunrise and sunset. That's where we have a lot of brightness and a lot of uh, colors. When you look down, I realize that it's a little more difficult uh, to find things on the surface than uh, when you do it on the maps. Because on the maps you have borders, but in space you have no borders and you have only natural 
rivers, mountains, beaches, water and forest. So you start to understand that uh, in many cases our separation uh, on the earth is more artificial. Naturally we are living on the same surface. So you start to feel that we are more united. On the ground, we live in a different country with uh, different view on some things, but being in space, we uh, we all exposed in a harsh environment. We all have about the same motivation to go up and uh, majority of us, and actually I would say all of us who was in space, uh, start to care about um, environment, about earth, about people on earth. And you start to feel kind of uh, brotherhood. live on the same earth, with the same, bigger than uh, station, but still spacecraft that are flying through the space. And uh, we have joined problems together, environmental, technical, uh, philosophical sometimes, but we need to solve uh, these problems together, and that's the best way how to do that. I think what we do in space, what we do in space together is a good example of how people need to live on the ground. I know that people sometimes start to argue with no good reason for that, but again, especially when you're in a harsh environment, uh, you rely on each other, you try to help each other. That's how we live in space and that's probably can be a good example for, for people on the ground. I'm happy that all this political turbulence doesn't affect us too much. We try to keep this area protected and uh, keep this good example to show maybe politicians and maybe other people in my country, in your country, uh, showing that that's really how we need to live. If you want another look at any of the stories we featured today, you can always find them on YouTube and Facebook. You will also find lots of other great features there on a wide variety of NASA topics. So be sure to look around. If you're looking for good conversation about human spaceflight, check out Houston We Have a Podcast, our weekly show talking with folks involved in all areas of space exploration. Today, we let you listen in on a chat involving veterans of Mission Control Houston to give you the inside story on what it's like to fly the International Space Station from here on the ground. Go to nasa.gov slash podcasts for this week's episode and all our previous episodes and the full library of all the NASA podcasts. They are all also on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, and SoundCloud.